G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. I am too, uh, I am here. I am here. Are you here? We're all here. I'm too, I'm here with two awesome people. We've got Manak from India and we've got Baron from Austin, Texas. Is that right? Did I get that right? I yeah. live in Austin, Texas now. How are you both? Very, very well, Matt. Thank you uh, again for having us. And um, it's a pleasure to be here as always. I'm great. I'm great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Matt, to for arranging this we have a very interesting thing to talk about today so we do have the new a93 and it's global shutter which has obviously made some people very excited and it's got lots of people thinking what does it actually mean and of course this is the first version of this technology but is it because we know that canon have global shutters already and they're in the market we know that the red is already a global shutter global shutters are out there and there's at least one other a z cine camera that's also a global shutter it's not like the first time we've had a global shutter and the red is a five thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollar mm. camera so even at this sort of price point they're already existing this got the three of us chatting about the notion what we saw in our comments was people going oh you know sony's brought this new tech to market and we should we should all be very grateful for this new tech that sony's uh birthing to the world and it's like but are they? And that got me thinking to the birth of Sony, the the, the alpha Sonys. And my, my kind of uh, proposition is that even back then, Sony was standing on the shoulders of giants. And in this wide ranging video, we cover a lot more topics, including Sony's engineering philosophy, the Minolta origins, how good were the A7 and the A7R, do Sony's fail in the field, global was always coming, what will the next Z9 be, who really makes Nikon sensors, Sony is not in the top 10 of semiconductor manufacturers. Really, is the camera industry codependent? Is the camera industry rivalry fabricated? What will the A93 dynamic range really be? Would Sony Alpha 35 mirrorless exist without Canon and Nikon? And would the Z8 exist? without Sony. All of that and more in this video. I asked all of us to bring our new favorite toy. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. it is. Nice, oh. nice. I've had a chance to use it for, I'd say a few weeks now, and um, it does take outstanding images and it's a very special lens. It's kind of like a cheat version, a little bit of the of the 200 F2, a little bit, not, not exactly. Like obviously the 200 will compress the background even more so, but it's got that sort of character of like uh, a little bit different character that's very exciting. And I think it's 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 notable because I, I believe this to be uh, one of the first lenses that Nikon has produced that takes more or less full advantage of the Z mount. And this is something that I've been talking about. I know Matt, you've been talking about it. I know Frames, you've been talking about it, but we've all been talking about this for a long time. And Nikon themselves, when they first brought the Z system out, talked about it, mm. how the Z mount was a very special thing because it would open up optical uh, technologies and options in the future that uh, would be unprecedented. There's one right there because there is no other 135, 1.8 that's like this. And I doubt there will be because they physically can't make it like this on a different mount. I took shots at the at the Austin Capitol with it of a of an attorney uh for a, you know for his for a promotional for his website and for promotional work that a marketing company was doing for him. They love the shots. I don't have to tell you they're like, "Oh, these are incredible hero shots." And I'm like, "Yeah, thanks." I mean, I'll take the compliment, but the the lens make, you know, makes it pretty out it's, it does stand out from other images you might see. Mm. Mm. I mean, so, it's, it's, it's a tool, isn't it? It's a tool that's yeah. helping you deliver to your clients even more. And I suppose you're coupling that with your Z8. So it's really sort yeah. of a, a perfect yeah. coupling. Matt had asked us to bring our, our our favorite sort of new something. New is relative. If you want to say new for 20, 2023, I easily would bring out my Z8, this lens, um, the actually the 17 to 28 nikon you know tamron badged lens whatever you want to call it i love that lens i'm shocked by that lens it's, yeah, great. it's so small and light that for traveling purposes it's 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 I, I love it but i just picked this one because of all of those three like this lens is like i mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of like a a, a lens nerd and 
the op just the optical part of like the optical superiority the, this massive rear element i just love it thanks baron i mean you uh, every time i have an interaction with you have an interaction with you, you kind of make me think of spending more money on lenses honestly like i have to, told you so many times like every time i have a chat you're like shit a few thousand uh a few thousand gone uh, you know so so yeah i i sort of um i really liked that i really like the plena and i was thinking do i really want the plena right now because if i 1.2 is probably going to come out soon but i wanted to have something like that and uh, you know what i found i wanted to obviously it's not nothing that it, it cannot compare with the plena but i got really interested by this filtrox for the fuji system okay this is 75 1.2 it's almost oh, like yeah. it's like 115 uh 1.8 and honestly this is only what 375 us dollars in us dollar terms okay i mean 370 370 us dollars in indian currency if you convert it it's going to be around around that so and uh, i mean honestly the rendition the image quality and it feeds so much light to this tiny apsc but high resolution 40 megapixel sensor that it i think it really feeds so much light light to my fuji xt5 i think it's quite it's amazing to use this of course um i'm probably going to decide on the uh, 135 plena or or between the 135 and the 35 uh 1.2 after seeing the 35 1.2 and i'm probably going to get my hands on i think tomorrow uh on this just to try it out and see how it is the planner oh nice oh so okay. you, you haven't used it yet no i haven't used it yet so i'm oh, just going to oh, uh, yeah <laughs> so i we uh, were talking after but we can we can do another video where we all talk about our 135 the zf i mean ah oh, yes the zf this is honestly this is uh, people talk about uh, complain about how it they say that it feels like a brick maybe but i've never used a zf without this uh, small rig hand grip okay because in in my market it actually comes to the hand grip it comes with two um high speed cards v90 and v60 and one extra battery and a charger wow so that's, like, should... that's a lot of extras That's yeah. a lot. Of, yeah. I wish I wish they would have done that in all the markets. That that that's a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, I I think they should because I think it is attracting so many new people to the Nikon system because I can watch my uh, ZF videos and can see that they are confused over the basic things about like for example the ISO and the dials. I know that they're not from the system. So it is attracting so many new people to the system. That I think they should have they should give these things like the charger and an extra battery. at least the charger and extra battery in all markets you know i, mean, I would say the, i would say also i would say the grip i think they should give the grip cuz that's the only thing that people have really complained about so if you gave the grip that kind of ends that i i agree, just, I, agree. i agree, I agree. Darren. and I they, agree. and they yeah. did that in australia for the first month but not anymore that yeah. they gave the grip Lovely. this is the pocket 3 which is just so useful for content creators like us Mm-hmm. So this is just the most amazing for content creators and but I was on holidays and it's just really stabilized. Now I've been looking at Z8 footage, 4K footage versus this and obviously it's not anywhere near that. But for the form factor, the price and its overall flexibility, I just think it's amazing for that sort of stuff and you'll see me out on my scooter now with this because you can put it in a mode where you attach it and then the gimbal will keep working which will be fantastic. And another thing I love about it is so this is a tripod mount, right? So you can just you can just stand it wherever. And of course it's got full face tracking so I can put it on my desk and it'll follow me around and and that'll all work. Oh wow. You can remove that so we remove that. But then this is a battery extender so you don't even have to have that. So once you take all of these bits off, just have a look at how tiny it is. <laughs> and this will still mm. run for like if you just run it straight it'll still run for like an hour an hour and a half with this i was able to shoot all day and when i when i mean all day i mean like 15 hours of just buttoning on and buttoning off whenever i felt like it and i and i didn't run out of power 
this comes with the the extra content creator kit, which is like an extra two hundred dollars, along with a wide angle lens and a, a few other bits and pieces. So for the right use case, the right moment, this this is really cool. And I think this this flippy screen is probably the most interesting part because not only does it turn the camera on, but it all also allows you to shoot if you're recording. Like so, I've just hit the record button. Mm. And my card's too slow. That's what that orange box is. But you can see now it's recording there, the little red box. So you can shoot vertical if you want, and you can shoot horizontal, and it's as easy as that to do that. So, uh, yeah, very cool. Let's say if you mount it on your body and start running, does it do a great job of stabilization, or you can you can see the steps sort of? I haven't done it yet because I've only been uh -huh. home a few days. But uh, we will test that out, Manak, and I will tell you. But I, I think based on what I've done so far, definitely walking, no problem. R running, mm. I suppose, you know, we'll see. Of course, mm. I'm very dainty. I'm quite light-footed, so it'll be amazing, of course. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about our, our topic. Sony doing awesome stuff, standing on the shoulders of giants. Do you think it's fair? It's unfair? Let's take ourselves back to 2013 when the first Alphas came out. It was the A7 and the A7R, 2013. And I actually purchased the A7R. I purchased it at the time it was released because I thought mirrorless is very exciting. And I already owned a mirrorless camera. I already owned the Nikon mirrorless camera. The mirrorless was already a thing. It wasn't like Sony invented mirrorless. They didn't do that. and but they did give us full frame. And mm. I bought that camera and I used it and I was excited about it. But unfortunately, the build quality and ergonomics and a whole lot of other things quickly circled me back to my D800 at the time, which those two cameras had the same sensor. They, they appeared to have exactly the same sensor. Uh, but Sony did some funky things like they gave us compressed raw files where the dynamic range was just not the same. And it was quite mm. different. And this was something that they didn't change until halfway through the A7R2 with a firmware update sort of three or four years later. So I was there at the start. That's where I come into this. I, I, I own both systems. I would bought Sony digital cameras before. Before DSLRs arrived, there were some great cyber shots. Remember they were called cyber shots? And yeah. Were, there yeah. Some really, really weird and unusual cameras. <clears throat> I've always been a photographer who's just bought the best tools for use case. And for me, the idea of mirrorless was great for the use case of just having a smaller body. So I was into it for that reason, but it didn't deliver. Anyway, that's me. One of the arguments uh, in favor of Sony is to say that, you know, yes, all of that could be true, but, you know, for full frame, the, the other manufacturers did not actually shift to mirrorless. They're still holding back. And I would say that's not true. Because I think it is only a mount decision with dual dual pixel autofocus. Canon was already doing mirrorless in essence. Okay, they already had uh, the same same kind of autofocusing system. And in live they, view, you mean? In live view, and they could they could actually focus on sensor, not through a mirror uh, and and a secondary focusing mechanism. So I would say it was only a matter of the mount. And it's always for a legacy manufacturer. It's a huge thing to change the mount because there are so there, there are millions of consumers, millions of photographers and videographers who are using all of that old gear. It's a it's a monumental decision for someone to say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to change that. So I do not think that it is always a it was a matter of actually them not willing to go ahead of time. Uh, for uh, Nikon, it is a priority that they want to focus on photography. Canon wanted to kind of play the both systems. They're already in uh, sort of film, they were already producing filmmaking gear. The legacy mount did matter to them because it mattered to ultimately to the market. I think that is the one thing that probably held them back. I don't think that they didn't have the technology. For Nikon, they could have taken a bit more time, a couple of more years, sort of get to the sort of uh, get to a stage of finesse, which they are, I think, as you can uh, see now, even Tony finally. <laughs> said that the, uh, his uh, Nikon Z9 is actually focusing better than the Canon R3. And if you watch Tiff Ferry's video, he says he convincingly shows how uh, the Z9 is actually performing uh, better than the A1 in birding. So I think uh, I do not think it's a matter of uh, not having the innovation bone. I think 
going back to the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants, and this is a very famous uh, quote, but the quote was, if I've seen further, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. what I mean by it. Uh, and Isaac Newton, obviously, is the father of modern phys physics and all kinds of other things and a great mathematician. Sony bought Minolta. They made video cameras for a long time. They made, they, they've been innovators in the electro, uh, consumer electronic space for well, that, as long I mean, as I can remember. They made I, video I, cameras I, and they made yeah. pocket cameras. Or, and they did a lot of things like they made Betamax when yeah. VH, you know, and, and Beta was better than VHS, yet Beta lost to VHS because Sony had a very stringent um, licensing program and VHS didn't and VHS won because of that. Yeah. Um, and then the same thing happened, like, you know, th that kind of thing happened to other companies and it was kind of a mistake. And Sony went on and they, they, they made all kinds of consumer electronics. They still do. That's what they actually are known for. And that's actually what they excel mm -hmm. at. And if you look at their cameras, to me, their cameras are a product of consumer electronic um, engineering mentality. So, and what I mean by that is they're, they're not designed in a, in, in a robust manner with the idea of surviving through time. They're designed mm -hmm. to work optimally well for certain specific use cases and then likely to, to be replaced. And, and that's kind of a, a, a fundamental difference, I think, of, of a mindset between the companies. But going back to 2012 or whatever it was, they bought Minolta. Minolta yeah, was go, a company go back that- Go to the Minolta part because that's so sure. important. Yeah. So Min they bought Minolta. Minolta was a, at that point, they probably weren't doing very well because that's probably why they were selling. But I do remember Minolta was a pioneer of certain technologies going all the way back to the eighties. One of the first autofocus 35 millimeter SLR cameras that I ever shot with was a Minolta. And I think it was the Minolta 7,000 or something. I can't remember, but it's the one that I took to class as a teenager. And I was told I could not use because using autofocus was cheating. And therefore I was not allowed to use that camera in the class, like, which is an, I, I found to be highly ironic and given today's view on autofocus. But, but anyway, Minolta was a, an innovator of their time. It was, they used to have a, a, a marketing slogan from the minds of Minolta. Oh, I wish I had a picture. I'm too scared to take pictures. And I'm not smart enough. Anyone can take great pictures with Minolta's 35 millimeter autofocus compacts. Minolta Freedom 2 for decision free pictures and Minolta Talker for words of wisdom. Too dark, use flash. Both are autofocus, auto everything. Hey, Dorothy. Minolta, Freedom 2, and Talker, autofocus wizardry. Only from the mind of Minolta. And they they made this autofocus camera early, early on, the, before, Ni before Canon or Nikon were doing it. And so Sony comes along and they buy a company that has a legacy of some sort. And then they started to make DSLRs and they basically failed. Look, I, I mean, they didn't fail, but they weren't doing very well doing that. And they didn't have much invested in terms of the legacy, so why not start anew? That's a very savvy business decision. Obviously, it was very successful. They did very, very well. You take the A7 and the A7R, but take the A7. The A7 was not a good camera. The A7 had pretty slow autofocus. It overheated. The battery life was terrible. It had no lenses. It had one um, SD card slot. It wasn't a very good camera, but it was. here's what it was. It was a prototype of the future. I submit that the A93, like the A7, is not a great camera, but it is a prototype for the future. And yeah. what I mean by that is why some people might be outraged, but how could you say it's not a great camera? It's incredible. It can do all these things. And the answer is yes, it can, but it does not do those things very well yet. Shooting at ISO 250 is not a great thing, no matter how you want to spin it. You can say, yes, you can get away with it. And how would you get around it? And how would you work with it? All those things are fine, but it's not anyone's optimal choice. And so, but one day, maybe not long from now, we'll have a global shutter with ISO 64 yeah. and that will be fabulous. What yeah. I think is so Sony are pioneers. They're technology pioneers. And I love them for that because they've forced other companies like Nikon, which is a company that I, I, I love their products and have for most of my life to be better. To me, 
Nikon doesn't usually put something into their camera until it's perfected. They usually, they, they're not usually the earliest adopter of something new because that new thing might fail. And their concept is to build professional equipment that does not fail in the field. Absolutely. And Sony's fail in the field. That's, they have a record of failing in the field. It's getting better. And obviously as they've improved, they've, they've, they've reduced that failure rate, but we don't even know how a nine three is going to perform in the field. Actually, I am very excited about global shutter. I actually think it's great. I'm very excited that Sony did this because it, to me, it starts the clock running and it's a clock I've been wanting to start running because I want to get there myself. So I believe that I'll have an, a Z8 Mark II maybe in two or three, maybe in three years from now. And that will have a global shutter and it will be largely perfected. Can I just conject though that, and this is really a nitpick, when you say the clock is running, I would conject that the, we already know that Canon have global tech and they've announced it and we've and Nikon have already announced they're working on global tech and they yeah. put out patents 2016 2017 and more recently in 2021 and and this is where this is where i think the sony marketing drums they drum very loudly that we're the first and all that sort of stuff but it's kind of like well you know what all of these companies have been working in parallel behind the scenes on this stuff and as you've just said Nikon work on it until it is guaranteed it won't fail us. Whereas Sony seemed to be a bit more prepared to get it out in a kind of, you know, let's say an 85 to 90% state. Uh, and we know Canon is willing to do that as well. Cause the yes. R5, the yes. R5 is a case in point of, of a, of a half baked camera when it yes. came out. If you consider the three companies philosophies, it could well be that they all started on the same day, their development. And the, the you know the, the stopwatch started and it's just not it's not a matter of when they started developing but it's a matter of when they just actually bring it to market and so can, and if I, I could if i could just say then when i said that the clock was ticking i do think i was uh that was confusing because i see what you mean what yep. you're saying is no they they've all been doing this it, they, this didn't start nikon doing it and no, i agree with you definitely 100 percent yeah. I guess what I mean is it put it kind of put the world on notice yeah. that this is now a thing. Mm. Like you can now expect to see something like this. We you know we've been ruminating what's you know what how the hell can they make the Z9 II any better? And I think I might have said it in in a, in one or two videos recently. It's like well how, how can you make it better than a sensor that's already that's already keeping everybody happy when it comes to sports and you know nobody's going my my uh, my antelope has got bent legs because of rolling shutter, and the golf club is bent because of roll. Like it's already kind of there, and of course there are a couple of things that the A nine three achieves, and it's more about banding and and less mm. about flash photography. So we all we all agree with all of that. How do you make a Z nine two even better? Well, is global the next step? When I think about that, I think to myself, all right. So the engineers that were getting the Z nine out, they they have finished engineering it probably something like two years before it actually came out and then they're going what's next and we're talking about like 2019 it's a long time ago that they're speculating well what how, how the hell do we beat the z9 what what's the z92 going to be and i suppose what i just get and i'm not referencing what you've said here baron but just the general echo chamber of people in my comments going oh please we need to be thankful for sony for them bringing global to the world and it's like no, I think all of these companies knew that global, you know, global is the next step. And there's already, there's already been other global products around. Well, anyway. I, I would say thankful is a weird thing to say, agreed. But like, I have a question. So the Z9 and Z8 sensor, it's made by Sony. Is that correct? I've done a lot of research on that, actually, in the last few weeks when i was at the nikon museum are, are both of you guys aware that nikon make lithography machines and lithography machines are the machines that etch the the, the wafers that make processors sensors ram and they sell these machines to everybody who makes silicon products there's this assumption that sony make them but who are actually the best chip manufacturer in the world who, who makes the the the, the highest 
grade highest quality smallest chips in the world i mean maybe i don't know who makes the m3 apple chip that's right and it's not sony it's the taiwanese semiconductor company what i believe is that there's a there's an echo chamber i suspect some sensors have been sony sensors let's assume for a second that it that the z9 sensor is manufactured by sony yep my question is well that's interesting because they never used it in any of their cameras Yep. They probably don't so, have the rights to do that. Well, my point is, I don't think that this is, it's not a situation where Sony decides. So a lot of Sony people say Nikon screwed because they only get whatever sensors Sony allows them to have and not the newest one if they don't want them to. But I don't think it works like that at all. Well, not even a little bit. So Sony it's, Semiconductors or the Sony Sensor Division yeah. is a completely separate division yeah. from sony electronics which is where the cameras come out of and that's out of the unit that makes tvs and other things like that right they right. are two separate entities and, and i don't know if you've seen the video that i made about this like six months ago but apple reese tim cook recently came out and said we've been working with sony for years making our sensors for our phones right now if you think about how each phone has three or four camera sensors in it and they sell 275 million yeah. phones a year there are a billion sensors going to apple every year and in my video i showed that the entire camera industry and everybody that uses sony sensors is not even one percent of what they right. supply to apple and that's right. just apple that's not automotive that's not industry that's not all the other phone manufacturers and so when you start to get a sense of the fact that both Nikon and Sony Electronics are tiny customers of Sony Semiconductors, you start to realize that neither of them have very much say. And a lot of the R&D would be driven by Tim Cook and his team going, we need better iPhones. Give us something better. We need more from you, Sony. Always been said that Nikon design their own sensors. That's always been a constant, right? Always. They design the color filter that goes on the sensor and they design the raw converter. In other words, here's the information and this is what we're going to do with the, the electrical signals and the noise and everything and, and, we, and our color science. All of, all of it's that. So you've got that. Nikon also make the stepping machines, the lithography machines that etch. I think they also make their own stencil that they literally expose through to etch the sensors. So I think they make those as well. Even if Sony is involved, the metaphor that I've come up with is, is Sony is an industrial kitchen where you bring all of your recipe, all of your tools, and literally all they do is kind of stick it in the Sony oven, bake it for you and hand it back to you. And so when you say Sony are making them, they're just kind of sticking it in their oven and they don't do well, any other part. They don't come up with the recipe. They, they're, they're not mixing it. You know, they're not putting it together. And then as soon as it comes out of the oven, they take it and they decorate it with their color it's filter. Basically, it's basically assembled by Sony. Well, partially. Uh, because because yeah. what if Nikon are using their, what if they're, what if it's Nikon machines that are uh, involved in actually even etching it? Right. Because I get, I get the sense that Nikon sends them um, schematics of what they want and then it's manufactured now sometimes it might be on a base sensor like the base sensor that's used in the a7 IV may end up being the base sensor that's used in the z63 hypothetically uh, but with the recipe that goes into the final production of that sensor as a as an actual production unit is nikon driven and so it's a different sensor actually than the one in the a7 IV, even if the base sensor is the same because of all the stuff you're saying that goes into it on top of that like fundamental like light reading site yeah well to so, me it, it comes down to the fact that for example the coca-cola the company in australia that 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 makes coca-cola is not coca-cola it's it's another company called coca-cola amatol and all they do is they get the secret recipe and they and they and they make it but they don't that they, they didn't invent coca-cola and so it's kind of like well who who makes coca-cola because without the recipe it's just a dark water sugary drink with bubbles in it that nobody likes but with the recipe it's a game changer so there's that side of it another side of it is we know that there are other companies that 
make semiconductors. So there's there's the Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. There is Intel. Ta- there's Tower Jazz who recently got purchased by Intel. And then there's a ton of small players. And I'm pretty confident in this day and age, anything can be reverse engineered. And I'm not suggesting mm-hmm. that that's happening. But what I'm trying to make very clear is this notion that Sony are the only people that can do it. I, I just think it's actually not a fully thought out notion. There are other companies like Apple who are creating things that are even more impressive, silicon wise, than Sony. And I just can't see them. I just can't see anyone who's got control. Like there's this great article on Wired that I suggest that everybody goes and reads. And it's basically the article is visiting the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company is like kind of seeing the face of God and that these guys are creating such astonishing products by etching billions of transistors onto something the size of our little fingernail and that these things work. And these guys are the leaders by far. And they, they're they probably using Dutch equipment for the lithography. But what you learn once you step out of photography and you start stepping away from the Sony echo chamber is that there are other companies doing more and they're doing it better. Now, they're not specifically doing it in camera sensors, but you're using the same tech and it's uh, it's still lithography. And then it's sort of what you attach to the back. But I just can't see... Why is it that Sony have a monopoly? Why is there this notion that no one else can do it? What's the uh, argument? The argument is that Sony is, uh, Nikon is dependent on Sony and Nikon can only go as much as Sony allows them to. Yes. Uh, I think that's completely false because like you said, Matt, that in the real world, the Sony sensor manufacturing company is a company with its own P&L. And the rest of them are their clients. The story ends there. Anyone who doesn't get it from a realistic, it's not like Sony owns something and it's their technology. No, some of the work that Sony does is done by schematics given to them and the mandates given to them, their clients. is a cost benefit analysis. There's a raw material. This is really a minimum order quantity. All of those things that happens. And end of the day, it's a business that runs for itself. It does not run for Sony Alpha. First of all, it it has zero allegiance on Sony Alpha because everything that they develop is for themselves. If as a business unit, they are not self-sustaining. A7 IV is overheating already. Okay, I'm I'm live streaming with the A7 IV and it is already overheated twice. Wow. Now I have got my battery door, uh, sort of I have pulled out down a battery door and obviously the screen is out. I've also removed the hot shoe cover from the top. I'm just trying to do as much as I can. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. But just before you go on, you throw a bucket of water on it. That oh no, no weather sealing. Sorry, go on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I own this. Uh, it so it was a joke that I couldn't. You know, I had to run through that <laughs> gate. When the gate swung open. I had to run through it. Yeah, absolutely. This is I was saying that. You know, I think I think the important thing is to understand that that. The Sony sensor manufacturing company, I don't know what this name is, that company needs to do things in order for it to survive and report to their bosses, this is what I made this year. And like you said that, you know, the the, the camera companies are tiny customers for them. I am 100% sure if the volume of business is 2%, 5%, 10% coming from uh, the camera companies, they are not putting their focus and R&D on that. They will depend on, this This is how the logistics will go. If, if, of to, if I sell total 100 units in a year and five of them are to Sony and to, and to uh, Sony Alpha and to Nikon and to someone else, someone else, some other, uh, let's say Fuji, of course, Fuji. Fuji, yeah. If it's only that. five sensor out of 100, I'm not going to spend my time going into the details of the schematics. I'm going to get it from them. And say, okay, if your schematics is ready, if you if you can also do a bit of technology transfer to me, I'm going to put my guys and my and my capacity to producing your chips. Because yeah. at 95, my big daddy Apple or whoever it is, that's where my my effort should go in. My R&D team right. will not be working on the five percent. 
That makes no sense. So <laughs> it speaks, is by design of the business that they will have to depend on Nikon and Sony schematics. And what speaks to that is if this is my, what I was getting at, I guess I agree with what you're yeah. saying completely. What I was getting at is if the Z9 is in fact manufactured by some Sony entity, the fact that they have never used and are not going to use that sensor proves case in point that it's not something that they spent R and D money on. Well, it's not something that they own that they can use. Right. Well. right. It's not, it's basically something that they produced for somebody else. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, and I think that shows that there, that the, the, there's not this bias within the company, as you, as you point out frames very well, they're not, they're not secretly like trying to promote Sony alpha over Nikon or whoever else they produce camera sensors for. I think they just produce sensors for their customers. FX30 carries a 26 megapixel sensor. Do we really believe that the sensor was not with Fuji in 2018? It is the same damn sensor. I'm pretty sure it is the same fundamental of a sensor. They had uh, x -trans. And after almost five, five and a half years, you have the same resolution and, uh, uh, on an FX30. They are coming from the same stable. It just cooked differently. This is a CMOS. That's a, because the, you know, the layout is on top is different. Yeah, the color filter, the, obviously. The color filter is different. Fuji uses so, completely different color filters. And if you read it, if, if you look at it, how fast that sensor actually is. I mean, we've all been talking about how Fuji sensors are fast because they don't have, a, uh, for years now, Fuji don't suffer from a lot of rolling sh shutter. And the FX30 is now better. I'm pretty sure it's the same fundamental of a sensor on which they built the FX30. If it was really their sensor owned by Sony Alpha, they could have used it a long time back. What have they, what have, have they been doing on it? Because if you're if you're if you're telling me that if you're serious about the APS in crop sensor market, you would use the best sensor available for that. Why didn't you do that for the last five years? This is just brings us to the basic understanding that yes, Sony are doing things that are we are in a codependent ecosystem. We are in a codependent ecosystem where Sony learns from someone else. We uh, Nikon learns from Sony a bit, from Canon a bit. They are all inspiring each other, pushing things forward. That's great. I'm sure everyone has someone else to thank for. That doesn't mean there's only one one company, one brand who is. Let's go with this. this you got to get, the, gotta get the bucket of water now, frames. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm overheated again. Just focus on a voice. Focus on my voice. I don't think it's just one company or. Uh, you know, um, one organization or one brand which is leading the whole thing forward. If you if you look at what has happened with the A93, what people are not talking about yet is how they have actually changed their ergonomic. Where is that coming from? It is. It just it looks a carbon copy of. They have at least tried to do make a copy of the Z8 and the Z9 curvature on the grip. All right, and the button yeah. on top where of they it. position the shutter, the shutter the position shutter. and angle the is, is is the Nikon one. Well, yeah. But what I just wanted to say that you think, look at the A1, look at the Z9, and the A1's fifty megapixels, the the Z9 and the Z8 are forty five. Now, wouldn't you think if Sony were pulling all the strings, that clearly, to me, the forty five megapixel is better for 8K because you're closer to native 8K. It's it's a, it's actually, I think, a smarter choice, even so it's the marketing of it is 50 versus 45. But the reality of it is it's very minimal when it comes to actually real pixels. And I right. think you actually get a better result when you're wanting to read out the full sensor. If the world that the Sony people suggest exists, exists, I can't see Sony giving, you know, I have some Sony users saying to me, oh, they gave them that sensor. It's like, why would they, why would, if they are in control, why would they have given them the better technology? That logic alone makes the entire thing fall apart. The A1 was supposed to be the best. And then you've got the Z9 being, I would say, actually technology wise better. We know that it can sustain high speed for much longer. If Sony Electronics, Sony Cameras was in control, they wouldn't have let that happen. There's your logic. And from then, then on, the whole thing just falls apart. They're not in control. Sony Cameras are not in control of what Nikon are doing. 
I I was told um, by the Tamron folks, high up Tamron folks in in America, and they deal with the Japanese all the time because that's they go there all the time. It's the head, of, you know. And they they told me directly that he's like, you know, in in Japan, there, this rivalry between like Sony and Nikon and Canon it doesn't exist. Like in Japan, they're just all friends and they all go to lunch together and hang out. Like nobody, there's not any of this. This is all like a YouTube sensation in America. But to be very clear, you you can get the shot with a Sony, a Canon, or a Nikon, no matter what the shot is. Of course. You can get the shot. They're all incredible. And if you compare them to the equipment that that at least Matt and I were using 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. there isn't a camera out there today that doesn't blow those cameras away in ways we couldn't have imagined like this notion that there's a bad camera a better camera like it's a preference my preference is for high quality product very refined product you might say that i like um a ford mustang or do i like um a bm like a, a bmw 330 ci so they're both they can they're both good cars in different ways, but I like yeah. the refinedness. I like the German engineering and the refined nature of, of the, well, the BMW is kind of strayed, but you call it like Porsche, even to this day, they're very refined. And I like that. And Nikon to me of the three of Canon, Sony and Nikon, Nikon is definitely the most refined of the three. In my opinion, the products they put out are the most, uh, sort of like the, the build quality is the highest it, that's pretty like un, it's not disputable if you actually use both of them and hold them next to each other i mean i know that frames you have a an r6 mark ii that you're renting right now and it feels like plasticky right feels kind of yeah like it does toy. i mean it does yeah. feel like, I mean, toy. like so so like for me canon hollow. always yeah, it's hollow it feels hollow that's a great way to describe it and i think like does it work well? Yeah, it does. It works great. And can you get the shot with the R6 II? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but it, but the lenses, when they focus, they make, they're noisy. The tolerances are a little looser. They seem to chatter a little bit more. Um, like this thing is a brick. Like it, it, it just, it, every little dial is so well, it just, it's so smooth and so controlled. It is and same so with the focus well ring. done to the last minute detail. And, and and when it focuses, it's like silent virtually, and it and there's no like sense of like chattering or uh, when I, the fifty one point two Canon lens. When I was using that lens, it's noisy, and it, if and you can see the the element moving back and forth, and it's kind of like mm, 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 mm. I don't know. It, to me, it wasn't a, as refined of a product. Does it create beautiful images? Yes, it does. It does. It's still a great lens. Do I, I do, I, I prefer the Nikon one, but I, there's fantastic images come out of the Canon one and same with the Sony one. So for me, I like Nikon because I like the aesthetic of Nikon, the build quality of Nikon and the fact that they engineer it for the final outcome, not for the bragging rights of being first really. We're not discrediting Sony at all. We're not saying that Sony hasn't done the work. I think they're doing it. It's just that, like Baron said, it is a first great first step. It is definitely not the final product. Because you look at ISO 64, 32,000 uh, of a second shutter speed, and ISO 250 and 80,000 of a shutter speed. I think you're cutting more light at ISO 64 and uh, 180,000. 32,000 of a second shutter speed definitely well, cutting more light well we know and, it's it's two and a half stops to 100 and then it's another two thirds so or sorry it's one and a half stops to 100 and then two thirds so it's two and one sixth stops so 80,000 goes to 40 goes to 20 and then goes down to like 15 or something so it's yeah. it's actually like it's actually one thirty two thousand that sixty four is cutting more light. Sorry, but I agree that they don't have the rolling shutter. But we have to also remember that they're using half, almost half the uh, information from the sensor. Exactly. So let let alone we don't know what the ISO and dynamic range performance is like yet, mm -hmm. and we know that it's not a dual gain sensor. So there is already a whole bunch of things that are lesser resolution, not dual gain 
probably dynamic range. A $6,000 camera, it's great for a, a sports professional that, you know, they get the, the Associated Press to basically fund their R&D. That's the smart yeah. move. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, a smart move. That's a smart move because because from a consumer standpoint, or even a pro like into like a like a indie pro, it makes no sense to spend six thousand dollars on that when you can spend four thousand dollars on a Z8. Yeah, it makes no sense. And get get ninety nine point nine nine percent of your use cases well, better. Better. Well, what I'm the only thing that it does better, it doesn't do better in a way that I can't still compete. Exactly, I still compete. Look, so, I reckon I reckon the only place is, and I've had someone talk to me about this in my comments, is banding when you're in arenas and when you've got multiple different flicker speeds, like you don't have one flicker speed, you've got multiples in frame. But that's such a that's such a very well, unique at, use case. Actually, I would I would conjecture that so the so the way the Sony works is it waits till the height of the flicker and then it shoots. Right. But if you have different flicker rates, it can never sync that. Oh well, yeah. it'll have to catch a band. So it's got the same problem that if there's multiple, so, like, multiple so I like, think that I, I think for me the way the A7 uh, A9 III is actually interesting is the screen. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we all That's love it. the screen. We all love the yeah. flip tilt screen. Right, Nikon, Nikon, listen up. We love the screen. We, we need we need that screen, and probably on the Z6 uh, Mark III, Z63. Let's hope so. That's yeah. so. because I agree. That's that's the camera. That's the mid tier all rounder that need. That's the sort of cam camera that actually needs it. I totally. Yeah, agree. Okay, I have to. I have to go. Okay. Frames. Frames had to dash everybody. It, it was a hair appointment or something. I think. I mean, he was looking so great. I, I don't think he needs more hair. But you know, you've got to keep it tight. You've got to keep it trim. I need to have hair appointments more often. Well, Matt, what I wanted to say about the uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, man. As as you know, Nikon and Canon have been doing this for a hundred plus years. There's a difference in it's kind of like old money and nouveau riche. I don't know if that makes sense, if that analogy makes sense, but there's a difference and there's kind of a there's a philosophical and ment like mentality difference. So my my friend works in the repair shop at a major camera store here in Austin. Mm -hmm. And he says all they ever see is Sony's coming in for repair. He says, you don't see Nikon's coming in. Even Canon's not that much, but Sony's, he says, they come in all the time. Yeah, man. And look, this is the stuff that people like you and me have talked about literally for years in this space, but nobody, you know, there, there was no respect for ergonomics. There was no respect for color science. There was no respect for build quality and all that. But the only thing they ever wanted to talk about was autofocus. That's it. And Sony's lost that war, right? That war is over. It's complete. It's a truce. Everybody's at the, at the, at the level where anything more is, you know, photographing bullets. And I don't think we're ever going to get bullet time AF. Guess what Sony have done? Guess what they love to do? They love to create drama, drive a wedge, and they've started the new war, which is the global war. And the reality is, well, from, you know, analysis so far, it's something that most people don't need, which is, you know, where where I went. Remember, I talked about use case all those years ago, and not everybody needs the crazy Sony AF anyway, use case. Well, this is even more so that that even less people need the, the global use and case. How many people? This is also, I agree with you, by the way, 100%. But furthermore, like, and they must have known this. I think they do know this. Who? Not many people are going to actually get this camera. A absolutely. I mean, it's six thousand dollars. Absolutely. Like nobody, like some guy was wrote on a comment that I saw in a response to me when I was making some of these points. He said, "Oh well, you know, this is just so much better. Like if you're taking pictures of your family." And I'm like, "Are you going to buy a six thousand dollar camera to take pictures of your family? Like, are you yeah. out of your mind? Like, I first of all, I don't even, I didn't understand his point because it makes no sense, but." But still, like just on a price tag, that's not what people who buy this camera are buying it for. They're, this is very niche. This is for, I would say this is for professional and collegiate level sports, period. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Full stop. Yeah. Nothing, not even for wildlife. Yeah. Because and look, it doesn't have the. There was a lot of talk about portraiture, but as we, because of the flash sync thing, but as we've kind of worked out, there's, you know, re really how much is it changing that with all of the issues that we've talked about and the work, the workarounds that we all use today yeah. to, to, to solve these things. And because it's 250 ISO and because it's 24 megapixels, that makes it 
uh, for a lot of portrait photographers, not of interest. Well, and for it's, wildlife, I think the same thing. The the, yes. the, the ISO is fine, but the cropability is not there. So it's it's a camera they made for for the Associated Press sports photographers. It's niche. There's no question it's niche, and that that has been, I think, correctly earmarked. And I mean, even in my original video, I said, okay, it's very exciting. Like, well done, Sony, for going global and getting it out there. But the Z8 and the Z9 is still going to work for 99% of use right. cases. I mean, Ron Pollard, I, do you know Ron Pollard? I do, I do, yeah. Yeah, Ron's a great guy, great photographer. And he shoots the golf tournament, the PGA yeah. golf tournament. And he's not. he shoots it with a Z9. He has perfect golf clubs on the swings of the pros the top guys not i'm not talking about like like the junior high school kids i'm talking yeah. about like the professional top of the line he's like i don't have any he's like i got no rolling shutter problems with my z9 we've done well in summing up all the kind of pros and cons and that this is like the like the a7 and the a7r originals it was kind of like a first to market testing the market seeing who adopts it who gets into it got a lot of you know got got a lot of asterisks at the bottom of the of the spec page and well, you know it's exciting that it's going to I, I mean keep pushing the industry but we'll yeah. see how it goes they said they said oh it doesn't affect dynamic range and i thought wow that's amazing but they never said it was iso 250 so so then i found that out i said oh so what they're saying is is between iso 250 and up the dynamic range is equivalent but you can't get the dynamic range below so there and i'm speculating we don't know that's true by the yeah. way i'm admitting we don't know that yeah. but logically the way they stated the marketing like they skirted the truth in a way yeah. that but their statement could be true and yet the dynamic range isn't as good even though their statement was true and of course they haven't published the best of my understanding any dynamic range information at all i think that's a good point you make there if the sensor is rated at 250 what is the dynamic range of current sensors when they're at 250? And it might be something like 13 stops or 12 stops or whatever. I'd have to go on. Right. It. But it's not the 14 or 15 that we get from the A1 or the Z8 or Z9, Z7, D850 and so on. That's a really good point. To circle back to where we started and we will wrap this up because I reckon we've been going a while, standing on the shoulders of giants. What, what was important to me to state was that Nikon, Canon, Minolta, Pentax and a whole lot of other companies had built a market and been doing amazing things, uh, not only in film cameras, but in digital cameras. You know, there's a market there that was well-loved and well-used and, well, Sony stood on the shoulders of giants and they did jump in and they brought something interesting. But you and I both know that the original A7 and the A7R were not astonishing cameras, but they were interesting and they started something, kind of, because we've talked about the fact that there were mirrorless cameras before and so on. And the credit that they deserve in my eyes is that I currently have a Z8 in my hands and sure. I might not currently have this this camera. If they never existed and Nikon was allowed to keep selling their DSLRs without any real reason to shift, they probably would have eventually come here, but they may not have come as quickly. Maybe not. I think that's great. Like innovation is always a good thing. Anyone who innovates pushes the other. I mean, all these guys are toting the pre-capture on the, the new Sony A, A9 III. The pre-capture thing is like this big thing that also I've seen on YouTube lately. Today, a lot of uh, these guys were touting it. And I'm like, yeah, but the, the Z9 has that. They didn't talk about it then. You know, yeah. now it's a big deal. But yeah. the point is innovation helped everybody. I pondered uh, whether we would have mirrorless if there was no Sony. And my belief is we would have because, as I said, there's the, the V1s were mirrorless. And I agree it probably wouldn't have been as quick. I believe for mechanical shutters, we'd kind of reached the, the limits of physics. At, at, at Canon, I think, got to 16 frames per second. Nikon got to 14 frames per second with their mechanical shutters they would have themselves gone well you know canon and nikon want to keep leapfrogging each other and and i do i do think there was a convergence of the technology happening obviously we had live view we had right. these video cameras as you said we had canon and their focus system was already similar to the focus system we now see on the rf mount i actually think it was coming it's possible sony knew it was coming and it's possible sony went well these we can do it quicker and and I've read an article from a Sony CEO or engineer at the time who said these cameras weren't great and we didn't even know whether they'd work, the, you know, the, original, the originals, which we all agree weren't great. They came to market quickly 
brought stuff that wasn't that great. They kept out, they chipped away and they kept at it. I do think there would have been a ZA, if not in 2023, it would have been not that much later. Because one of them would have done it. Canon or Nikon would have done it. They would but let's been. say it would have been a year later. That's a year. It's a year sure. I got to use it. Sure. Sure. So so to me, there's some value there. Nobody here is, I don't, I'm not, I know Matt's not, I know Frames isn't. He even, Frames and Matt both own Sony cameras. I actually don't own them, but I've used them. Um, and so obviously nobody thinks they're bad. That's not the point. Yeah, no, that's not the point. Sorry. We're just trying, what, what this channel has always been trying to do, because I kind of started when there was the rise of Sony mirrorless and then Nikon and Canon were getting into the space. And then I just observed this, this, this essentially trolling of anything that wasn't Sony perfection. You know, it was a disaster and it was the end of the world. So I've just tried to bring some ba balance back to that, some balance and logic and sense back to that narrative that it's like, you know, Sony, Sony's way or the highway. And it's just, it's, yeah. it's not true. All of these manufacturers are doing slightly different things and, and and they're all doing parts of their things better than each other. You'd say, well, where's Canon's flagship? Sure, it's not here, but in the entry level and in the APS-C space, they're probably delivering the best thing for wildlife and birding photographers for that entry level space. So that's where Canon are now. We've talked at length about Sony and Nikon. So, the, you know, they're all they're all doing their bit and they're all chipping away at different sectors of the market. And I would say in the end, they're all standing on each other's shoulders now. Absolutely. No so question. it's kind of like, it's like, the, it's like, you know what it is? It's the exposure triangle, except it's the three of them sort of like yeah. teetering like this. Yeah. And I mean, even, even Fuji, you know, is, is they, they're definitely doing their own thing by focusing yeah. just, just on APSC and just on small, medium format. And, and that's cool too. And then obviously we have some much more niche players. Baron, thank you. Um, thank you, Matt. Let's do this again soon. It's been great. I would love to. I would love to. I'd love to. Um, and at some point, hopefully, we'll 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 get our uh, the notion we had of shooting, trying to do a like uh, a like a shoot off with some tech, pick some lenses and do some shooting. We'll see. Well, now it's the planner. That's what's that's what's next for us. Let's let's right. go hard or go home. Okay. Thank you. All right, mate. Well, we've got the other sign off, so we might just jump to that. Gentlemen, it's been amazing. Please check out both of these awesome channels. It's been so good to have everybody here. It's been so good to have Baron and Frames here, Manak here from either sides of the world. It's been amazing <laughs> talking about, yeah. talking a little bit more about the camera industry. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh... thank you as always. Baron, great to see you, Matt. Thanks for arranging this. this is, I mean, this is all your idea. And I think it came from the comments that you share with each other that, you know, uh, oh, Sony is again leading the way. And yeah, I think it's a great conversation. I we, I honestly didn't see this conversation coming. Uh, great to have the have uh, to have the points made. Lovely. Thank you, Frames. It's been great to see you. And uh, you too, Baron. Take care, everybody. And please... We'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. So pre please do share with us what you think about this topic. Did Sony in 2013 stand on the shoulders of giants, of course, starting with their purchase of Minolta? And of course, there is no camera industry without Canon, Nikon, Minolta, Pentax, and all the others that were already there. And this was an industry that Sony did a deep dive into. So you do not have a market for them to have exploited without the others making that market. So please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. It's been so good to see you. And uh, if this is your first time here, we would all love to see you again. So subscribe to me and them. Okay, see ya. Peace.